microphone, but if not, let, um, let Joanna know and I will try to stay here and behave. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's been a, a, a great three days um, already in, in Portugal. And uh, um, I met a lot of really exciting students and professors and staff. And uh, the one thing that I actually want to start with is by saying that this country is probably the only one that I've visited, and I've visited many, where so far I have not met anyone who complains about anything. I find that remarkable. <laughs> so it seems that you are a very happy and content people, and uh, congratulations on that. Um, but I, I think what, what, what does unite us is our, our shared fear of the future when it comes to the future of planet Earth. Right? We, we all know about climate change, and in the context of, of that, I want to give this talk. Frame it uh, in that context and then propose one of many solutions that we need. That said, I, uh, I sometimes tend to drift away into storytelling. Um, I sometimes uh, react to questions from the audience um, that hopefully you will have plentiful and don't stop until the very end. If, if you are like me, um, usually after a 45 minute talk, if I hadn't taken notes, I forgot what I wanted to ask. So feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions or comments or other disagreements. Right? I'm not claiming that I'm always right with what I'm going to say. I propose viewpoints at, at times. So, so by all means, um, this, this should be a dialogue. And it's, it's, it's a dialogue that should be driven by how can we help address climate change effects through opportunities to create new industries that can generate a lot of revenue. I'm proposing trillions of dollars and thereby also creating a lot of jobs that are of course needed. So let's jump into that with, with that in mind and uh, talk about um, how CO2, which is a problem, as we all understand, can actually become a good opportunity. And I will introduce to you how I think about products we can make from CO2 in two different tracks, different types of products and um, their role in, in climate change mitigation. And very critical as always, when you think about new technologies, um, what we come up with in a research laboratory might not necessarily work in the real world. How do we decide early on what makes sense and what does not is something that we spend a lot of time in, in my own research group and with colleagues actually around the world. So I want to illustrate all of that with two product examples. And that is um, construction materials, in particular concrete, and, uh, and then jet fuel. Two products that in a direct or indirect way we all deal with uh, frequently. And they also have in common that we use lots of these materials. So ultimately, of course, I want to address the question, how do we, wh what do we need to do to build this industry, to use all of that CO2 to do some good things. But let's begin where the problem starts. Right? This was the world before a lot of humans left on it, where there was a natural equilibrium between CO2 being created, say so through decomposing plants and animals, and CO2 being taken up by the biosphere and, and oceans. There were little swings as we all know, over the millions of years that led to ice ages, etc. But before all of that started, there was certainly a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere that led to very, very high temperatures. We know that. We also know that with the amount of CO2 that we have added to the environment, we're headed back into prehistoric times where the average temperatures will be so high 
that life as we know it as humans will become very unpleasant on planet. We begin to see the early effects of that. And um, uh, we have to recognize in that context that the planet doesn't really have a problem with climate change, it's us. Right? Because if millions, billions of people are displaced, we, we will certainly not be able to handle that. So how do we deal with this now? We cannot, of course, continue business as usual. We must do a number of things. Amongst them, we have to reduce and eventually stop adding additional carbon to the atmosphere. Another way of thinking about this is we need to stop using fossil carbons, right? No more petroleum, coal, natural gas. But that still leaves us with what we have already put into the atmosphere, one and a half to two trillion tons of CO2. Some of that, at least we must remove because the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere is so long, it will not disappear. And where to? Um, we already see the oceans becoming so acidic that corals die. So literally we must build machines that isolate the CO2 out of the air. And then we have two options. We can pump the CO2 underground and store it there or carbonate um, basaltic rocks and other rocks. Or, and that's what I would like to focus um, on to, we could look at making products out of CO2. If we think about it, the carbon dioxide molecule is nothing else but an alternative source of carbon. So we just broaden our toolbox, so to speak, because a lot of products that we need to use every day, look at these masks and many other COVID related uh, products that we must have are made from petroleum. We can make them from plants, we can make them from CO2, we can make them from fossil based carbon. We just need to figure out what's the best. Already told you that we must eliminate fossil based carbon at some point. So we are left with a choice. Bio-based polymers, it's not science fiction, that exists. But there's not enough land to grow plants, to produce fuel, to produce polymers and other chemicals that we might need. So we, we are left with looking at what can we make with the CO2 molecule and how. There are a lot of questions, of course, and part of this talk is dedicated to addressing those. But you all have seen lots of those types of curves that if we don't act, it just gets hot. And bringing that curve down requires more than just stopping to use fossil fuels, fossil fuel. Right? And this number, up to two trillion tons, that's a lot of CO2. We've only spent 200 years or so to put this into the atmosphere. But the really frightening part of that is we only have about a tenth of that time to remove it. If we don't, we literally do not stand much of a chance to keep the temperature increase here over pre-industrial levels to below two degrees. It's a somewhat critical number and um, we, need to, we need to act fast. Yes. Could you minimize the uh, CO2 level? Absolutely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So, so the point of this slide is to show that the later and the slower we begin, um, the more delayed we have an impact on the temperature increase. And, and that, that is substantially critical. Right? So, so time is of the essence. It's 2022. Look at the time scale that is shown here. This is, by the way, from the latest IPCC assessment report. So we're, we're dealing with the fact that we need to build up new technologies in record time at a record scale, something that has not ever, ever been done before. So big, big challenges and big opportunities. And if we march on, summarizing that, that whole context, we have no choice but to adapt. 
some cities and countries already built walls around uh, around the ocean fronts and river fronts. Um, buildings need to be redesigned to deal with heat and cold um, temperatures. We are on the way to decarbonize a lot of the energy production systems, but it's not fast enough. More needs to be done. Massive efforts are underway to begin capturing more CO2 and store it long-term on the ground. Again, today's talk is focusing on putting that CO2 to use and make products that we need anyway. That makes the challenge easier to shoulder because if we look at capture and storage, costs a lot of money that we all as taxpayers have to pay. Right? So it's a waste disposal process. Whereas here, yeah, it's still not free, but at least we make something that we need anyway, okay? So that offsets some of the, some of the expenses. And if we, again, more eye candy than, than, than not, if you look at, oh, this resolution is, so I've taken a chart out of this um, AR assessment report six um, that shows different technologies and their impact on um, uh, CO2 reductions by 2030 and how much they cost. The bars here show, the, the, wide, the width of the bar shows how much CO2 actually can be addressed through that particular process. The color shows how expensive it will be per ton of CO2. You want this bar to be long and blue. CO2 utilization is short and dark red. So low impact, super expensive. Anybody in their right mind would now say, um, maybe we shouldn't do that. Right? Um, the optimist in me says, that's an opportunity. If we can make it bigger and cheaper, that's the thing. And keep in mind, we still need a solution for carbon-based products. Life on earth is carbon-based. So summarizing that somewhat differently is thinking about two time and two um, magnitude scales. We have a lot of legacy CO2 in the atmosphere that must be removed quickly. And most of it sadly has to be stored on the ground. But beyond that, we have processes that just cannot be decarbonized. There will always be CO2 emissions, but we need to get to a net zero world. How do we do this? Well, here is CO2 utilization as a good solution. Is that allows us to take care of that inevitable portion of emissions. And what actually can we make out of CO2? I will focus only on two products in describing how they're being made. But let me summarize that we actually have a lot of opportunities to cover a broad spectrum of products. This is the result of a market study that we have done six years ago. An updated version is about ready to be published in the next month. But for now, let's just focus on um, what we actually can make. Leading this chart uh, are construction materials, concrete and aggregates, gravel, sand, stuff that we use to build roads, etc. cetera. Um, for those products, carbon actually is a new element. Those are traditionally not made with carbon. Whereas fuels, chemicals, carbon fiber, polymers are traditionally already made with carbon, but that carbon is usually just fossil based. And then in agriculture, I mean, we make a lot of urea and other fertilizers where, where CO2 is an ingredient. But until not too long ago, um, producing proteins and uh, carbohydrates from CO2 was new. So we can now already make animal feed from CO2. And companies are already working on making food for humans from CO2. Now, that range of topics, that range of products is really um, like, a, like a menu to choose from. What should I engage in? How should I decide what to do 
and what's best for the environment, what's best for me as an investor, um, what's best for me as a government, I mean, various different questions. Um, and, um, and then where, where does it make sense? Should I build these factories here? Should I build them in the north? Should I build them uh, in the ocean? So I want to begin addressing some of those questions. And here is where I would like to introduce these two tracks. And I label as track one materials, those materials that keep the CO2 integrated for more than 100 years. I will show you how this works for concrete, because there we turn the CO2 into rocks. Okay? And, um, and, and therefore, we can consider this to be a permanent solution. Some polymers live for hundreds of years. Carbon fiber can be considered essentially an indestructible material. Why is this important in that context? Because once I made the material, the CO2 is permanently removed from the atmosphere. So it is equivalent to me collecting it and pumping it underground, except that now I also have a product like a house that I built with a concrete that actually is useful. And then track two materials are materials that decompose or get used up by let's say combustion um, and release CO2 in less than a hundred years. That is roughly a time frame where it is no longer really significant in terms of reducing the average CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And therefore, the climate impact and the economic value being given by both, but in a different way. Both categories or both tracks make money, but track one permanently removes CO2, track two only recycles it. So there we avoid the emission of fossil carbon. That's a win. And just relabeling that, that graph here one more time with some typos. So, so with, all that, with all that selection and, and all that, that work, am I now saying that if I use CO2 to make a product, it's better for the environment than if I do not do it. I think you can already almost guess what my answer will be. Otherwise, this would not be an interesting topic for a few slides. So we really need to spend a lot of time and effort to carefully analyze what's, uh, what's called in a life cycle assessment, how much CO2 actually is really being used, how much CO2 is actually being released, where does the energy come from that I use for this process and so forth. These are pivotal questions, not only for researchers, but also for governments, for investors. And um, there has been a lot of confusion over the last decade about um, uh, CO2 based products, because the messaging that was created was, you should do it, you should not do it, you should never do it, maybe you should do it. I mean, anybody in their right mind would say, I'll stay away from this. This makes no sense. So we spend a lot of time on um, defining guidelines and rules to help us make these assessments. And indeed, we show here in an example that we've published that from 99 different ways and how people have used carbon dioxide to make concrete, more than half is actually worse for the environment than making regular concrete. So that's really, really important to you to know early on. And I cannot stress enough early. With this community resource, a website where we provide a lot of tutorials, tools, spreadsheets, and guidance on how to do these assessments, we've built a global community that uses the same metrics to do these assessments. So that researchers have the ability early on to define, does my technology potentially make sense or not? Now, early on in the laboratories that I've seen uh, this morning, um, uh, we'll, we'll all appreciate this. Early on, you know, you know very little about your process. You don't have good data on efficiencies or conversion rates, et cetera. Um, so these assessments at best can be 
estimates. But that's helpful, not only in terms of absolute CO2 footprint, but you understand what are the most critical steps. And as researchers, we don't necessarily think about what it means down the road when we build the company. For example, work that we have funded in the Global CO2 Initiative required that researchers submit and work with us their data um, so that we could do these assessments. And in one case, uh, a, a team had uh, developed new sorbents for CO2 capture. And in our analysis, we showed that the synthesis is so expensive because there's an economic component in our assessments too, that it will never ever be possible to make a profit. And we put a point to them and said, look, either you find a different solution for this, or we stop funding you. This produces no result that will ever have economic value. So we helped identify for them that the solvent they use to wash out reagents um, was the exp most expensive component. They used highest purity toluene, which in the laboratory is of course perfect. You must do this. But in a deployed technology, maybe technical grade toluene is fine enough, but they haven't thought about actually exploring this. So these assessments do not just give the, the final, like the label on your food, like the calorie count and how much nutrients are in there, but it also provides guidance all along research and deployment. And that is absolutely critical. And I think the, the CO2 utilization community is embracing that more and more. So let me, let me go and talk about two examples and illustrate um, how um, we can use CO2 to make concrete, which is probably not something that, that um, um, many of us um, have thought about. And um, I mean, coming back to the introduction, I've, I've worked on this now for about five years. And before that time, uh, I certainly have not thought about sticking CO2 into concrete. So why would we do this and how is something that I want to talk about first. And then I will also talk about, can we make jet fuel um, out of CO2? And um, we'll go through a set of calculations to extrapolate how many factories we need to build to meet our jet fuel demand. And then ask the question, can we do this? So why is concrete such an interesting material for us? Well, remember, it's a track one material, so it can help us remove CO2 permanently. Secondly, the built environment, houses, bridges, roads, etc., are responsible for roughly 40 to 50 percent of CO2 emissions and energy use worldwide. So anything we can do here to reduce that CO2 footprint is a win. We also have learned to build much more efficient homes more efficient heating and cooling. So the contribution to the CO2 footprint of, of the built environment that comes from the actual structure increases in relative terms. So we need to focus on that too. And here I, I, want, I want to ask you, if any idea how much concrete is actually being made globally every year? Some wild guess. I can tell you as much that it's a lot. <laughs> what do you think? Keeping in mind that concrete is really heavy. Is it a million tons, a trillion million, tons? Trillion, 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 trillion tons. Well, it's, it's not quite that much, but, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's 26 billion tons. The only material we use more of is water. So, even though we know that concrete is a problematic material from an environmental footprint, given that we need to build housing in record amounts, I mean, estimates are we, we have to build the equivalent of one New York City, Manhattan, once a month for the next decades to meet needs. Right? And, and we're not talking about the Western world, but right? just globally. So, so 
the problem will get worse. And also, I mean, let's face it, concrete is a wonderful material to make very unusual shapes. We can just pour it into all kinds of shape. These days we can even print it and make even more interesting things. So it will be a good effort spent if we learn how to make concrete in a more environmentally friendly manner. I typically like to spend a minute on explaining how concrete is made because I'm, I'm, I'm aware that not everybody has looked into that in detail. And there's also often a lot of confusion between cement and concrete. Cement is a component used to make concrete. But most of concrete is actually just rocks, gravel, sand. And the cement is essentially just the glue to hold that together. It's a powder that is of high alkalinity that reacts with, with uh, water and some CO2 from air to form essentially limestone and some calcium silicates that holds together the rocks. So that is, that is essentially where that's at. And we, we look at all of these components to see how we can use CO2 to reduce the overall burden. But to, to, to drill deeper into why cement is sort of a, a real problem here, uh, accounting for up to 8% of global CO2 emissions. Uh, I have this cartoon from the Cement uh, Association that illustrates in, in graphical terms um, that we take different rocks that we um, mine in quarries, namely limestone, calcium carbonate. And we heat that at very high temperatures so that we drive out CO2 from the material. We're left with calcium oxide that reacts very aggressively with water to then form that glue in the concrete. And here is sort of a, a, a dual problem. 40% of the CO2 emissions in making cement come from just the heat for this oven. If we can heat with other sources, do not have to burn, we can eliminate 40% of the emissions right away. But we're left with 60% from, from, the, from the actual process. Can't eliminate this. We can do all kinds of tricks to use less cement and alternatives, but that stays with us. But we can capture that CO2 right at the kiln and reuse it. And here is how. We can replace the cement in the first place with waste materials such as uh, from um, steel making that have similar properties, have high alkalinity, react with CO2 to form carbonates. That is already being established in the uh, concrete businesses for a long time to mix with such waste materials. But what's fairly new is we can deliberately inject CO2 into the fresh concrete mixture. So instead of curing with water, we're actually curing with CO2. This works especially well in what's called precast concrete, concrete where you have prefabricated modules because there you have a closed mold, you inject the CO2, and the beauty is the concrete is stronger, so you need less. It also hardens faster, so you can make more product in a shorter time. So a lot of advantages. And then lastly, we can replace aggregates with materials that in of themselves react with CO2. And, um, and there we can look at a lot of waste materials, fly ash from coal fire power plants. Which we have millions and millions of tons to clean up, steel slag, minerals, and, and more. So a lot of ways in how we can reduce, if not fully eliminate the CO2 footprint of, um, of concrete. And just looking at some very low estimates, we can store more than 1.4 billion tons of CO2 in concrete. That's a significant number. Recall, right, right now we emit about 40 gigatons of CO2 every year. If we decarbonize our energy system, um, much less remains, and that alone will have a significant impact on how we can balance and reach net zero carbon. 
I always like it when one solution addresses more than one problem. With CO2-based concrete, we have that opportunity. I think, or I hope that I've shown you how it can have an impact on climate change mitigation. We know that some of the CO2-based concrete materials are better than regular concrete. And that actually helps because we all know of crumbling infrastructure, right? Broken roads and houses that, uh, that have cracks. We can fix that. And we also know that if there's anything we can do to help the construction industry build faster and cheaper, that is direly needed. In the United States alone, between now and 2050, we need new houses for 70 million people. How do we build that many houses in such a short time? Globally, there's an incredible shortage of workers in the construction industry. It's part of the reason we don't have enough houses. Nobody's there to build them. So this is one field where automation, robots that 3D print houses actually will not eliminate jobs, rather the opposite will be true. So it's a really fascinating opportunity what CO2 enables here. And then of course, um, another big opportunity for CO2 is if we could make jet fuel out of it. And there's a whole broader conversation that we may want to have about this, but let's, for the sake of this discussion, start with regular current jet fuel is made from petroleum that if I burn it, will release CO2 as a new addition to the atmosphere. We started this conversation by saying, we don't want this. So what if I start by saying, let's make this from CO2, because after all, it's just the reversal of the combustion equation. Right? I combine CO2 with water and lots of energy to make fuel and oxygen. Lots of energy meaning four times as much as is being released when uh, I burn the fuel. So from an energy point of view, highly problematic. Can we fly planes electric, with electric propulsion? Short distances, not long distances. Can we fly them with hydrogen? Not for a very, very long time. What do we do in the meantime? Maybe that's the solution. If we have enough carbon-free electricity, because then as we burn that fuel, CO2 is being released, we capture it again, and it can be net zero, ultimately. But let's just admit that CO2 is a problem because it's of such low internal energy. We've taken it all out when we use the hydrocarbons where it mostly comes from. So anything useful to do other than mineralizing it to carbonates requires a lot of energy, but it still can be a, a significant source of carbon if we rethink how we think about energy. Of course, we want to use as little as possible. That will not change. But it's more critical these days to avoid CO2 emissions. So another pitch for a massive scale up of carbon-free energy. So what I'm looking at is something in the distant future, something to work towards. Let's go back to that jet fuel, another big number. In 2019, the last year with sort of full travel schedule before COVID-19 hit us, um, the global jet fuel consumption was 287 million tons. At the rate at which air travel grows, the projections are that in 2050, 28 years from now, we will need 1.6 1,600 million tons of uh, jet fuel every year. Huge amounts. So let's figure out, can we make that much from CO2? Well, the first thing is, yeah, we can actually make this today. It's technology that is very, very old. Right? We, can, we can use renewable electricity, water, and CO2. We can split the water into hydrogen 
we use what's called the re uh, reverse water gas shift to produce CO2, uh, CO. And we run this through the uh, Fischer-Tropsch synthesis process. We can also um, electrolyze the uh, CO2 into CO. But again, the Fischer-Tropsch process is very well known, has been used for many, many decades. And therefore, the base technology is there. Could it be improved? Sure. There's nothing that can be improved. But the point is, there are currently large-scale facilities under construction. The Norsk plant is Plesio. The Norsk plant is currently being built in Norway with technology components from different countries, different companies. It's literally a modular system. And in two years' time, when the first facility will be ready, it will produce 12 and a half million liters of kerosene. Two years later, they will have a total capacity of 50 million liters a year. So now let me be ambitious and say, okay, we build a plant that is twice as big. In other words, produces 100 million liters of kerosene every year. So it will be um, about eight times as big as what you see here in this, in this technical drawing. But it's still, it's still sort of a, a plant of manageable size. How many of those plants do we need to produce 1.6 billion tons of kerosene. That was the number that was projected for 2050. If that North plant produces 100 million liters, we need 20,000 of these facilities. That's a lot of factories. Huh? So let's put this in perspective. Right? Assume you have plants and they will all be the same. Just going through the permitting process, you probably all you all have heard of, or if you own a home, uh, have suffered from building inspectors and planning, etc. So let's say we have a net of 20 years. That means we need to build 1,000 of these factories every year, or three every day. That's pretty ambitious. Can we do that? Perhaps, if we want to if we think we have to. Um, this in particular is a purely modular system. So one could think about, can we use the experience, the expertise, and maybe even the facilities of the automotive industry to literally have assembly lines and so sort of push out factories one after the other? A question still is, um, is this the right technology to remain with or should we rethink other things? And the answer is, of course, yes. And some of the fuel can be plant-based and whatnot else. But the scale remains the same. Right? And, and I think that scale, these numbers, are really what we need to keep in mind. Coincidentally, there are 41,000 airports around the world. So one could think maybe decentralizing the fuel system. Even though we have an established fuel distribution system, so there are lots of questions that arise that go way beyond technology, but um, uh, fascinating to sort of think through all of these uh, all of these cases to identify what might work best. There's actually a global council on sustainable development goals that um, I, uh, I have the pleasure to work on uh, that focuses on future fuels. So these. These scenarios are being discussed in earnest. But let's talk about money. One of these factories will cost $240 million. So 20,000 of them will cost $4.8 trillion. That's a lot of money, even if we divide it by 28 years. Again, the question has to be, can we afford doing that? Is that an amount that shocks us? Yeah, of course. I mean, if we look at our own personal checking accounts, you know, there's, 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 an, there's so many orders of magnitude that we don't really deal with, with numbers that big. Let's look at a comparison. Let me ask you, how much money do we use every year to subsidize fossil fuels? $5.9 trillion. 
Now, some of that, that's a number that the International Monetary Fund publishes. Some of that is sort of a fictitious subsidy because we don't account for the negative effects of, uh, of fossil fuel use. But there are actually real subsidies, money, tax money that is being spent to subsidize the cost of gasoline, et cetera. So all big numbers, all daunting, and especially daunting because we have so little time. But especially in, in light of that so little time, it's good to see that there are so many entities that commit to net zero uh, carbon emissions, countries, companies, and, and individuals for that matter. Uh, there are a lot of partnerships that you see announced every day. And there is a whole new markets um, uh, emerging that deals with carbon offsets, where companies manage to decarbonize most of their operation, but there is a residual for which they actually need to pay somebody else to remove CO2 and demonstrate that. I think that's a topic that is super important, but goes beyond this talk and the time that I've allocated, even though I haven't even asked how long I'm allowed to speak. But I think we typically stay within the hour or? So one hour. Yeah, okay. So in that context, if we make CO2 into concrete, that is an opportunity to sell an offset that is demonstrable, that is quantifiable, and therefore really a, a, a very good opportunity. But then a the whole thing comes up, so who claims credits? Who pays taxes, if there are any taxes on CO2? Who tracks and certifies and reports? It's a whole mess um, that one could imagine we need a global accounting system. How do you build this up? How do you make that efficient and not a, a, a blockchain monster that will require so much energy that um, it, it, defeats, uh, it defeats all the other efforts? So there are a lot of really big system level questions that we don't really have answers to yet. And we all work very hard to produce underlying technologies and guidance um, many of us, me included, work with governments to advise them on what they should do to create stability in not only the research landscape, but especially in, in taxes and rebates so that those who build new factories actually have long-term planning security. You don't want the laws change every four years so that if you invest in new technology today, that becomes economically unviable because now rebates are missing. So the role of incentives and disincentives is really, really uh, critical. But it also is very, very critical in that context of CO2 capture and utilization to understand that it's very regional. What makes sense here in Lisbon might not work in Reykjavik. What works in the Sahara Desert might not work in the US Midwest for geographic reasons, availability of resources, consumer behavior, and whatnot else. So we really have to look at this at a local level to identify what makes sense. Oops. And <clears throat> that brings me to one of the last things that I briefly want to touch upon, and that is, what do people think? like you and I, if we are being confronted about whether or not we want to use CO2-based products. Do we want to or not? So we asked 2,400 people, said, would you use a CO2-based product? We didn't tell them anything about um, whether they would cost more or less. We just said, would you use it? Overall, about two-thirds said, yeah, most likely, um, or yes, or definitely yes. That's a good sign. If we then look at um, uh, products specifically, people had lesser problems in using shatterproof glass, furniture, or plastic containers. With beverages, like, yeah, I mean, carbonated beverages, beer, Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. or we, we, we all consume one or the other, um, perhaps frequently. Um, and if we then tell people, well, what if this CO2 comes from air? Would you drink it? Sure. That's this blue bar. The lowest bar in this chart is 
what if that CO2 comes from a coal-fired power plant? And like, yeah, maybe not, maybe not. No beer tonight, maybe, maybe some other time. <laughs> Would you know that combustion, even of diesel fuel, is very often a source that beverage companies use for CO2 if locally none is available? Consumers just don't know about it. But that tells us a lesson. Before we go out and build 20,000 factories to make fuel out of a molecule that people are not really familiar with, let's ask them. Let's understand what people are expecting and address those questions before we actually go into full gear. Hugely important. So overall, I think we all understand that a lot needs to be done to address climate change. I also want you to not walk away with, with thinking that CO2 utilization solves all of our problems. No, 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 no. There's much, much more that needs to be done. But CO2 utilization is one of many important and necessary tools. Let's not forget that while these track one materials such as concrete and aggregates can help permanently remove CO2, especially the track two materials are the ones that give us continued access to carbon-based products that we must have. Soap, polymers, and many more things. So it's one path to ensure access to these essential products. Because again, it's a reminder, plants cannot be the sole source of carbon for us in the future. There are just not going to be enough of them. So overall, I'm actually very optimistic. This is um, Victor Lee, one of my colleagues and I, in Victor's lab where he invents very exciting new forms of concrete. And um, I thank you for, for your attention and uh, be happy to address questions, take criticism, and what else you have to throw at me as long as it's dry. <laughs>